This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. We're number one. That's what we'll have to start the podcast off with today. Chris Graham, Scott German, and I just had to say it that way. Uh, Virginia number one in the national rankings for the first time since 1982. I've been waiting to say that for uh, 30-some years, I guess. I don't know. Scott, uh, uh, the news today, uh, that, that is the news today. Virginia rises despite losing the game on Saturday to Virginia Tech. Virginia number one in the national polls in the AP poll for the first time in all that time. Uh, we were texting back and forth about it when it first happened. Your thoughts, Virginia, number one in the national polls. Well, you know, Chris, it's it's kind of like I don't want to say number one by default because that sounds like I'm I'm, I'm fighting that achievement, and I'm certainly not. Uh, but it, you know, I got to thinking about it last night after I come uh, back to earth a little bit after that bummer Saturday night. Uh, and got to thinking about it and looking at what happened to the other top teams. Um, you know, I thought. It wouldn't surprise me if, if the if the uh, um, you know the AP put us at number one because these other teams Villanova lost horrible game at St. John's uh, or excuse me at two St. John's uh, Purdue lost twice so we lost at home uh, played a played a bad game didn't shoot well particularly shot horribly actually and still came uh, within a free throw of probably winning that game. Uh, so I, I don't want to say that it was a fluke loss because that sounds like I'm, again, uh, you know, taking away something from Virginia Tech, and they played a hard, you know, they played a very hard fought game. It was very played a very good game. Um, so no, it really doesn't surprise me, and and I'm going to, you know, now I've kind of slight skated around the issue from time to time of dating myself, but I am old because I covered this team when they were last ranked number one in the nation. So it is. You know, it's sort of a bucket list to see if Virginia could ever regain that. They have. Uh, I hope that now my bucket list is just about complete. That doesn't uh, bode well for me, but uh, you know, I hope, it, hope things still keep going positively. But yeah, I'm not. I'm not all that surprised to be, to be honest. I was a little surprised. I thought the voting would go actually exactly the way the coaches' poll went. The uh, coaches' poll has Michigan State won. Villanova 2, Virginia 3, everybody's so bunched together in that poll. I don't know, and, and not that it, it should have gone that way. I just thought it would go that way in the AP poll, which is the one that, you know, has been there forever, and I guess the one we hold is in, in a higher esteem. Uh, but, you know, Michigan State was number 4. They won twice. Purdue was number 3. They lost twice. Villanova loses a game to a, a sub-500 team. Virginia loses a game to an NCAA tournament team. A team that I thought actually, I thought Virginia Tech would actually sneak into poll this week. They didn't. I was a little surprised by that. I'm, I'm more surprised by that, to be honest, that Virginia Tech didn't get into the poll than that Virginia rose to number one. And uh, so, and also I thought that yesterday the the news, uh, you know, when the NCAA tournament selection committee came out with its its one pre-selection Sunday look at uh, the the top 16 seeds, what they would look at as a top 16 seeds in the tournament field, and Virginia was number one in that one in, in, a, in a, a look that came out after, you know, Saturday's action. Um, I thought that might actually sway some AP voters. So, I, you know, I think there were a few factors there. Certainly, like you said, Scott, too, you know, uh, Villanova losing to a, a sub-500 team at home, uh, Virginia losing to a pretty good team has a factor there, too. Uh, and so, you know, now th the mechanics of it being what it is, it's a special time. You know, Scott mentioned that, he was a, a, a young reporter then covering the team back in 1982 uh, when the last Virginia was ranked number one. I was a 10-year-old. I was a, I guess that would have been third grade maybe for me, the third or fourth grade I would have been in 1982. Uh, uh, you know, fighting my mom for the right to stay up past 9 o'clock the, the, on late tips, midweek games, and, uh, you know, rooting for the Cavs and thinking, thinking at the time that, you know, boy, that was – that was going to be, Virginia was going to be number one forever because that's just the way things were going to go. I was 10 years old. I didn't have a big frame of reference for uh, things at the age of 10. All these many years later, and I wrote a column about this, uh, you know, 26 years later, I guess, or 24 years later, 2006, I co-wrote a book called Mad About You, Four Decades of Basketball at University Hall, A History of UVA Basketball. When I was writing that book, you know, that was, so, so 1982, it felt like we would always be number one. 2006, you're talking about, 
at the end of a nine-year stretch when Virginia had two losing seasons, three 500 seasons, just one NCAA tournament appearance. They lost that one game they played to Gonzaga in 2001. You know, that was a lean period, and it got leaner. Uh, there were CBI games. There was a loss at home to Liberty. Tony's first two years, Tony Bennett's first two years were uh, 500 seasons. He was 31 and 31 after two seasons at Virginia. And here all these years later, ninth season with Tony. Now, we were number two in the country for seven weeks back in 2015. Uh, Kentucky, damn them. They never lost that year until the Final Four. We could never overtake them that year. So now, all these years later, all this history later, to be number one, I know it, You know the, the more important number one is in April, not in February, but I still think it means a lot. It means a lot to Tony Bennett. Uh, he took over a program. He was 39 years old when he got this job. He took over the program when it was at as, about as low as it could get. It means a lot to these kids who were recruited. Uh, they were maybe not the top recruits in the country. They were good recruits, five top 100 recruits on this team, but but you know they, they're not the one-and-done kids. Uh, it means a lot to them, and it means an awful lot to people like you and me, Scott, and all the people listening in on this podcast that this program, even if it's just for this week, and I think it could be for longer, but if you, even if it's just for this week, we're number one in the country. I think it means a lot from all those perspectives to, just to see that, that one beside our name. Oh, certainly. Uh, you know, we talk about in previous podcasts um, – Having covered the team back in the '80s when they were number one, there was still all there was always that uh, dark cloud uh, out in the horizon when you were um, you you know when we reached that that uh, level of being number one that it, it wouldn't last. Uh, we were one year away. We were one uh, off season away from when Ralph would decide to take the take the money and, and leave Charlottesville and go to the NBA. And then you knew it was all over with because that program was certainly at the time built around. There was no doubt about it. No one could argue. It was built around one player. When that one player left, um, those aspirations were gone. And we then talked about Tony. When Tony came and, and, and the foundation that he was building, um, that when we did get to this level, then – just because we lose a couple of players to graduation doesn't mean that this program can't be sustained because it's that solid foundation where he's got interchangeable parts where he knows um, the type of uh, player that he wants to recruit. He doesn't have to get the one and done. He knows the type of player that he that he feels will fit the system. And more importantly, the assistant coaches know that. So when they're out beating the pushes, they're not wasting their time scouting somebody that they don't uh, that won't pan out, that won't fit into this program. So uh, it's very satisfying because the foundation we saw it laid. We saw it being laid back in early the early days when Tony didn't uh, just make the team, make his make the you know take the players that were there and work around them. He, he implemented this foundation uh, from day one. And it, it is extremely satisfying because now the foundation has been laid. The house is built. It's a beautiful house. But guess what? Uh, we know it can be replicated again down the road, uh, even if this doesn't last for a couple of weeks. This, this is a, someone that, that knows what to do, knows how to build that foundation to have a program sustain uh, this level of play. And that's extremely satisfying. It is, and you know now I'll, I'll I'll bring up something that I think is just a funny thing about the Virginia fan base, the Virginia tribe, if we can call it that. Um, there have been plenty. You know, I've been following Twitter all afternoon. Uh, I haven't gotten on the message board, so I'll say I haven't gotten there to see if there's a similar reaction. I mean, most fans are are accepting this and looking at this and saying, "Man, number one, this is awesome!" And you know, lots of lots of plaudits for the program and for Tony and the players and and for each other. But there has been an undercurrent of folks who are saying, oh, you know, along the lines of, oh, man, this is this is bad. You know, being number one in February is bad. This is going to be a downfall kind of thing. And I even saw Jerry Ratcliffe tweet to that effect actually on Saturday. You know, maybe it's not the worst thing that they lost the game to Virginia Tech because you don't want to be number one right now. I think it's such a unique thing maybe to the UVA fan base. You know, I remember a, 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 the the, the – uh, stepfather of my college roommate, a guy named Robert Butcher, who uh, was on the um, UVA Board of Visitors for, for eight years back in the 90s. And 
He would always say when something would go wrong in a game, he'd say, we can't stand prosperity. I think there's something about the Virginia tribe, I'll use that term again, that can't stand prosperity. We're number one in the country, and there's people who are up in arms about being number one in the country because, man, that puts a bullseye on your back. Miami's going to come out playing even harder tomorrow night. Um, you know, they're, they're, I think that's so uniquely Virginia. There's a self-defeating part of, of that DNA uh, that people like us hold that – you know, if, if something's going good, it's just about this close to going bad. Scott, do you sense that? I mean, do you sense that there's, you know, I mean, do you even have some of that thought yourself that there might be something bad about being number one right now because, you know, that we're Virginia? No, absolutely not. And I'll tell you something. I read Jerry's tweet, and I, and I responded back to Jerry. I'm, a, I'm as big a fan as Jerry. Uh, Jerry Ratcliffe is anyone. Uh, I've known him for 30 some years, consider him a very good friend. Uh, I've been to dinner with him, have had him at my house before. Jerry and I are good friends. Uh, and I absolutely was devastated when I read that. Uh, because to me, and that was tweeted before this ranking came out, right? Yes, that's right, that's right. So it's almost as though you're trying to... Um, downplay the fact that you lost and it was a good thing and i and and, and i'm such a competitor i don't think there's a, it's ever a good thing to, to to lose and and also i think you always want to strive to be the best and if, and if being number one in the nation uh if, if you're number one in the nation now and then come march come march madness come april you're not cutting the nets down let me tell you what it isn't because you were number one in the nation in the middle of february mm -hmm. it's because you got beat on a night that another team exposed your weaknesses. Uh, uh, had we won that game Saturday night, then we would have unequivocally. Uh, let, let's just go back and just play play uh, uh, hypothetical. Let's say uh, the ACC's leading three throw shooter uh, Devin Hall shoots ninety three percent. He makes one of those three throws. Then we all pretty much know the game's over, right? Yeah. yeah. And 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 we somehow or another survive, survive and beat Tech by one or two points, then we become unequivocally the number one team in the nation. But those stats, that one free throw, um, that's not going to change those ugly field goal percentage uh, statistics, shooting just barely over 30%. It's not going to change that we were completely lopsided in the number of three-point attempts we took, the number of two-point attempts we took, completely – not going to not going to change anything. Our players were just flat out exhausted. Um, whether or not we lost Saturday or won Saturday, um, those, as you said in your column over the weekend, the warts were exposed. And having lost Saturday night, I don't think changed anything. If we'd won, we'd become number one in the nation, and no one would probably be talking about those things. Uh, but you can bet your last dollar that coaches across the country were watching that game and uh, the word was going to be out on the street pretty quickly um, how you might beat Virginia or still Tony's got to figure out a way to give some of these guys some minutes on the bench instead of playing them 40 minutes a game. Uh, so I disagreed with that. I think you always want to have reaped upon you all the uh, you know the prestigious awards that you can have i don't i don't buy that at all yeah and i'm there with you i'll say this i, I give marketing talks a lot you know part of you know i gotta make money somehow and uva sports we follow it it's it's great people click and listen and we love the fact that you do a, a, a big way i make money uh outside of this is is i run a marketing company and a web design company and i give marketing talks to different groups and and one thing i've used as a as a opener for uh, marketing talks for way too long, to, to, I have to admit, is that the last time Virginia beat Virginia Tech in football, I'll, I'll bring that up as an example, the last time Virginia beat Virginia Tech in football, Facebook didn't exist, Twitter didn't exist, YouTube didn't exist. Um, and so Virginia fans have not been able to write on Facebook or Twitter or uh, post a YouTube video themselves uh, about Virginia beating Virginia Tech in football because th those, those mediums didn't exist in 2003. Even if Virginia wins one game and loses 20 straight more to Virginia Tech, 
at least that'll go away for a while, right? I mean, I, I can't wait to be able to tweet and Facebook message and do a YouTube video of me celebrating a win over Virginia Tech in football. So for 30 years or more, I mean, you know, at some point in the, the mid to late 80s, we started to realize, yeah, Ralph didn't have a little brother, and, you know, he, there wasn't going to be another Ralph coming to Virginia anytime soon. And so those years where Virginia was expected to win championships, ranked number one in the country consistently, they weren't going to come back necessarily anytime soon. You know, we've been waiting for a long time to talk about 19, you know, Party Like It's 1982 was the headline I gave to the to the story we wrote about the ranking number one today. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, now 1982 is in the, in, in the background. Now it's 2018. Now the last time we were ranked number one was 2018, and we hope, and of course, it continues. But I, I love the fact that it's now. And now you gave us a good transition there, Scott. We talk going from talking number one to talking some basketball, and I think I think I should I'll I'll, I'll jump on where you 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 were there. Yeah, the warts were exposed, and they would have been exposed with a one point win or a one point loss. I, I think I'll start with with the first the first of the two big things I think that we have to talk about is is the minutes for uh, Virginia's players. I went back. I'm. You know, I can't sleep after a, a loss like that. I, I'm sure a lot of folks listening, I'm mean, you, you too as well, Scott. After Saturday night's game, I couldn't sleep, so I, I, I was looking at box scores for <laughs> the last way too many seasons. And um, looking at Virginia's box scores this year and the number of minutes played by particularly Devin Hall, uh, uh, Ty Jerome, and Kyle Guy, um, and, um, and then, you know, comparing that to years past, and we were, yeah, those guys are getting way too many minutes. We saw it the other night. Uh, Kyle Guy played all 45 minutes. Uh, I think Ty Jerome played 43. Devin Hall played 39. Uh, I figured out over the last five games, those three guys have played just under 90% of the available minutes uh, to the um, uh, guards, uh, the three guards in our three guard system. And, uh, you know, looking back at previous years, uh, you, you know, the Virginia teams that have had the least success in March have been those teams that rely on their starters too much. And the season-long trend right now for Virginia is still actually more close to the 2015-2016 team that made the Elite Eight. You know, the number of minutes going to the starters versus the bench is consistent with those numbers, but the recent trend is going in the other direction. Starters are getting a lot more minutes. The, the bench guys aren't. And so... Yeah, we we need to see tomorrow night, hopefully, and, and certainly down the stretch, we need to see Nigel Johnson get more minutes. We need to see Marco Anthony get more minutes. Uh, I don't know that we can give more any more many more minutes to DeAndre Hunter. He got 26 off the bench the other night, but you know maybe Diakite needs to get some more minutes as well. But if those if 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 the starters are going to be relied as, on as much as they have been lately, I don't know that this Virginia team is going to be able to defend this number one ranking very long because. They're not going to have the legs. I think we saw that the other night. I think a big factor in Virginia losing that game and shooting all those threes was the lack of legs. And um, so that's that's that, that to me is probably the biggest issue that this number one team has to overcome is just, you know, having having Coach Bennett ha trust his bench just a little bit more. Yeah, I agree completely. Um, you know, we've got to – tomorrow night uh, we've got to get major minutes uh, from the bench. Our guards uh, – can't sustain that. They're going to be completely out of gas. Uh, you know, the, uh, looking back, and unfortunately, I was able to muster up enough courage or ignorance or whatever to look at some of the game again. And, and I am absolutely not ever going to question anything uh, that takes place on the floor uh, and question Tony. But you know, I, I really don't understand what, you know, we commented during the game that, that after that second, I think it was the second TV timeout when we had bolted out to a 13-5 lead, or maybe Tech just called timeout. Tony came back, disrupted the lineup a little bit, starting lineup, and he brought uh, he brought Nigel Johnson and Diakite off the bench. And, man, things went bad then. But I went back and looked at that tape, and – and I don't know how many other people did this, but in my opinion, Nigel Johnson did not play that bad while he he was in. He didn't do anything great, uh, but he didn't he didn't play bad. Uh, just before he came in, uh, Robinson had scored five points. Uh, 
and he hit a three in Hall's face and then drove past Hall for a layup. Nigel came to the game for five minutes. He didn't score any. Uh, I'm really not sure what transpired out there that when Nigel left, he never came back in the game. He, he, he set the bench the entire game. I, I'm really scratching my head and trying to figure out what more to him going to the bench and, and never coming back in. Because if he would have played his 15, 18 minutes, um, you know, all of a sudden you're not you're not talking about Kyle Guy having to play 45 minutes of a 45 minute game or or Jerome playing 40. You know, you put another 15, 12 to 15 minutes in the game from the bench by Johnson, and and the complexion of those minutes change. And I, I'm really scratching my head to wonder what got him on the bench for good that game. Did you, did you look at that, or do you have any thoughts on that? I have thoughts. I mean, I don't think it. I don't think what I'm about to say justifies Johnson not playing any more at all, and then Anthony not getting on the floor either. But in Johnson's five minutes, he only he only shot one shot. He missed a shot, and and there was one play on defense when he missed a rotation. I mean, and this is so you. I'm talking very nuanced here. He missed a shot, and he missed a rotation that that led to a wide open Virginia Tech three, and it was right after the wide open three that he went out of the game, and didn't come back. Now, to me, that doesn't say don't play the kid anymore. And I say kid, he's a fifth-year senior. He's a, he's a graduate. Uh, he's a, you know, gra- in grad school now. So he's not a kid in, in, in college basketball sense. But, you know, I think maybe what is at stake here, what, what, what's at play here is a little bit more – I think Tony looked at the schedule, perhaps, and this is just total speculation on my part. And, you know, there's the game tomorrow night with with Miami, then an eight-day break, and then you've got Georgia Tech and Pitt as your next two games. Not to say you want to count any game as a win, but those games, you know, Virginia's going to be heavily favored to win those games by double digits or more. And so you got eight days off after tomorrow night. you got a couple of games where your starters probably do get some more rest just by the nature of the flow of those games. Then you finish up after those two. You're at Louisville, and you got a home game with Notre Dame, a team that's you know depleted with all those injuries. So really, after tomorrow night, you know that that really really tough stretch we've been in for a while, where it's it's been one NCAA one NCAA tournament team after another after another after another. After tomorrow night, that kind of lets up a bit. So I think what Tony may have been doing, whether consciously or subconsciously, was just you know what. I'm going to ride my horses, I'm going to ride them until Tuesday night, and then we got a break. And then we're going to get ready for March. You know, that eight-day break might be a perfect time to get ready for March. You know, that's a, we get a couple days off, we'll start practicing, you know, get guys, you know, a little, little loose and that kind of thing. Kind of like our baseball team every year has the, the May exam break. They always seem to come out refreshed and energized, and that's the perfect time because May leads into ACC tournament, leads to NCAA tournament. We've seen those – those teams come out of that break really well. So I, I just wonder. I mean, again, I don't think Tony would admit to it even if you asked him the question. But I think that may have been the case, and I think he looked at it and said, you know what, if I'm going to – you know, this, the game wasn't going well. If I'm going to win or lose this game, I'm going to win or lose it with my best players on the floor. Um, that said, I mean, you know, I think in retrospect, Tony would probably admit, hey, that probably wasn't the way we needed to go. Um, maybe the reason Kyle Guy was 5 for 21, the reason Ty Jerome was 4 for 14, the reason Devin Hall missed those free throws was because of tired legs. But that's easier to say in retrospect. I think game time decision, Tony made what he thought was the right call, and it just kind of backfired a bit on him. That all said, it backfired, and Virginia lost by one, as we've pointed out. So so it's hard to criticize too much, but I, if, you, if, if you ask me, you put, point a gun to my head, that's what I would say why Tony made that, made that move or lack of move, as the case may be, um, and it just kind of backfired. Then again, like you said, Scott, we wouldn't be talking about this if Devin Hall makes two free throws. No, we, this would have been completely swept under the rug. Now, here's another theory. We talked about this during the game. Uh, obviously, Kyle had a horrible shooting night, so did Ty Jerome. Kyle's shooting was started during the Florida State game, um, you know, he had a horrible shooting game during the Florida State. We talked about, well, shoot, you got to keep letting them shoot. Do you think maybe, possibly, in the back of Tony's mind, Kyle's out there, he's missing everything, he's throwing up, he's just really having, he's really struggling. Uh, he's just playing, keeping him out there to hopefully.
Hopefully, maybe he makes one. He makes two in a row, and all of a sudden he catches fire. Whereas opposed to if you take him and you sit him on the bench, um, yeah, you might be giving him a couple of minutes blow, but then he's going back out cold again, and he's, his rhythm is not there. Uh, you know, this shooter's mentality is you just keep letting them shoot, and eventually they're going to reel off seven, eight, nine in a row, ten out of twelve, or something like that. You see, roll the dice, and you know, Saturday night they didn't come up the way we wanted them to. It's possible, you know, and Tony, of course, he was a shooter. I mean, he was Kyle Guy when he was in college and played three years in the NBA before he hurt his knee. I mean, Tony was the was the volume shooter at Wisconsin Green Bay. He, you know, he, he we we remember, or some of us remember that he was a he still is the NCAA's career percentage leader in three point shooting. Uh, made just under fifty percent of his three point shots. So, you know, he he has a shooter's mentality. He knows that, you know, you got to have confidence. You got to keep throwing them up there. Um, but I would also think, you know, as a shooter, he would know. And, and Scott, you said Kyle's uh, 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 re- recent rough patch started with Florida State. I tracked it back actually the last five games, this five-game stretch where Virginia's really, you know, playing a lot. The guys are playing a lot of minutes, and it dates back to the Duke game. Kyle over the last five games shooting 33.7%. Ty Jerome, 40%. Devin Hall, 42%. You're talking about guys who are, you know, are closer to 50% season long until that stretch. And so – you know, and, and I know enough, uh, you know, uh, tired legs when you're a jump shooter because Ty Jerome's more of a set shooter. You know, he's he's 6'5", and his release is more he, – he he gets off the floor a little bit, but Kyle is a pure jump shooter. Uh, he runs off those screens, and he elevates at 6'2". He's got to. And um, so, you know, you know, again, it's easier to say now uh, in retrospect, but – uh, Kyle himself, I saw a tweet. I think it was Sam Bloom, the uh, the beat writer for the Progress. Uh, I think it was him. I'm a tri- hope I'm attributing this correctly. But he he in, in post game interviews, this didn't appear in the the post game quotes that Eric Bacher sent out to the media after the game. But but uh, he asked Kyle, Hey, you know, you know, the way you were shooting, would you have, you know, would you have taken if you were a coach, would you have taken yourself out? And Kyle said, Yeah, he would have taken. And the quote was, I would have taken my ass out if it was me, uh, if I was coach. So. Um, you know, I think Kyle even reckoned, but of course, you know, a shooter also wants to still be out there. So, uh, but yeah, I think that that is a, that, that could have been a factor to Scott that, you know, you, you want to win with your best guys or lose with your best guys as the case may be. And those are your best guys. Um, and again, Tony rolled the dice, like you said, and he just, they just didn't come up, you know, they didn't come up the way one wanted them to. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I really believe there is. A chance that that does hold a lot of credibility. He, Tony's a shooter, and he knows what he's going through. And you pull him out, and you sit him on the bench, and then he goes back in the game. Um, you know, he's he's got to get back into the rhythm. If he misses his shot, and he stays out there, and he and and, and he's firing up another one. You know, thirty seconds later, subconsciously he may be realizing what he may have done, what he didn't follow through, or what what went wrong on the previous shot. We don't know, and I'm sure Coach Bennett uh, is aware of that minute situation. Now, Nigel Johnson's the key because you put him out there, and all of a sudden you give him his 20 minutes, um, and all of a sudden we're not talking about these guys having to play 40 games. Hall, Jerome, and Guy all get time on the bench. Uh, also, another thing that we overlooked a lot is that he often, Johnson often, guards the dribbler from the time the ball is inbound. And, you know, that's got to give the defense a few more seconds to rest on the other end, too. So, it's all these little things add up, you know. And it's, the casual fan may not see it, but um, if you look at this stuff through the um, magnifying glass like we do, it all, it all has an end result effect. Yeah, and I, I would point out, too, what the casual fan wouldn't immediately recognize, and I didn't, in fact, recognize it the first 10 minutes or so Saturday night, was the fact that tired legs, oh, yeah, tired legs make it so that when you're shooting a jump shot, maybe you're not getting quite the elevation you normally get. I think tired legs also factor in Virginia Tech's strategy. And I don't think, what I remember from the game, and I didn't go back and watch it, but when Buzz called that timeout at the 13-minute mark, down 13-5, up till that point, they had not been playing the they had, they had not been playing that matchup zone that they went to for the last 27 minutes of the game. They'd been trying to play straight up man to man defense. Virginia running their motion offense. They were running off screens and they were getting caught. And Virginia were making shots and, and Tech wasn't. So he goes to that matchup zone, 
And that matchup zone, basically, I mean, all five guys had their feet in the paint. And that was a really extreme version of Virginia's pack line uh, defense. Virginia's pack line is, extends out 17 feet. I mean, they literally, there were many times when we, we, we could look up. I mean, I don't know how you could see it on TV at home, but when we, Scott and I are in the arena, I mean, you could literally see all five sets of feet for Virginia Tech in the, in the lane. They were daring Virginia to shoot threes, and Virginia's tired legs weren't making those threes. They made 11 of 38. But, you know, the way to attack that is actually there were two plays at the end of regulation. Virginia down four with a minute to go. Tony called a timeout and ran a play for Ty Jerome. They threw the ball all the way from the, the, the baseline to the backcourt and then spread the floor. Two guys on either side. Absolute ma massive spread. Iso play. Virginia never runs iso plays. And so what that did, it got the Tech guys out of the lane because they were in a matchup zone. Matchup zone, you're going to stick out there to the guys. And Jerome was able to go one-on-one -on -one with the defender. I think it was Robinson, Jerome Robinson. Got him right to the rim, got a layup. So next time down, Virginia Tech misses the front end of a one-on-one. -on -one, same situation. And Jerome once again beats Robinson one-on-one. -on -one. It wasn't a layup this time. It was about a five-foot runner. But he makes that shot. And so the, you know, the, the best two offensive plays of the night were not – mover blocker offense plays they were spread the floor nba iso plays for ty jerome well of course afterwards you, you know you go back you know overtime comes you run your regular offense etc but you know t tired legs uh you know virginia's passing the ball around the perimeter they're not attacking the paint they're not getting you know they're either not dribble driving or passing the ball in the paint because you know even isaiah wilkins played 39 minutes and he's coming off uh, of a stretch with a bad back and a flu issue um, you know, it, it's just one of those things where I think Tony also maybe stubbornly wanted to say, hey, here's we're going to beat them the way we play, we, and we play motion offense, and we're going to run our motion offense, and it's going to work for us. Um, you know, two plays to interregulation, the offense worked when it wasn't the mover blocker, and, uh, you know, Virginia Tech took advantage, I think, of tired legs and a little bit of stubbornness on the part of Virginia. Uh, and, uh, you know, all that said, we lost by one. So, But I, I think, to me, that was something that really stood out uh, in terms of Virginia's attack or lack thereof. Yeah, it, you know, again, I, I, there's probably a mixture of a lot of factors. Being tired, uh, um, just maybe the chemistry. Uh, Johnson had been out three games and, and just getting the ebb and the flow of the game, we don't know. But hopefully, you know, um, hopefully – that ball uh, taking care of tomorrow night. You know, I was looking at some notes on the Miami <laughs> uh, website, official site of Miami Hurricane Sports, which is HurricaneSports.com. Earlier today, uh, their site just promoted the game as Miami plays host to Virginia in key ACC game. Now, uh, it now says Miami plays host to number one Virginia Tuesday. So, you know, the bull, the bullseye is already on our backs. Uh, last time UVA was ranked number one in the nation was December 1983. Miami head coach Jim Laranego was assistant under Terry Hall. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, some ironies there. Uh, but, you know, let's Let's hope that by tomorrow night, Johnson gets in, gets some more minutes, and everything's, everything's solved. You know, D. Keita, we haven't talked a lot about him, but he didn't get a lot of minutes either Saturday. So it's key for those games, for those two players. So we know Hunter's going to come in, but that's only one one guy off the bench. And you, to, to evenly distribute the minutes like you need, you need, a, you need an eight-man rotation, not a six-man rotation. You really do. You know, you look at uh, good teams. Now, and I spent some time also. This is, again, the, Scott and I are both basketball stat nerds, I guess, and we, we do these kind of things. And luckily we don't look at the same thing, so we can, we can compare notes. But I spent some time looking at both Virginia teams of recent years and their percentage of starter minutes versus bench minutes. And then I looked at some other top teams of, the, of recent years. And it seems like, I mean, it's, this is inexact. This is, isn't scientific at all. But it seems to me if you're, if you're talking about a ratio of, of starter minutes to bench minutes, that is that is optimum. It seems like it's in around the seventy percent range. If if your starters get seventy percent of the of the minutes and your bench gets thirty, you know maybe if you can get to thirty one or thirty two, even better. But if your starters get you know, around that seventy percent mark in minutes, that's when you're at your best. Well, there are two hundred minutes in a game. There are five positions, forty minutes each. 
So if your starters are getting 70%, that's 140 minutes uh, of your of your time. That's roughly 28 minutes each. Now, we know from Virginia's standpoint, Jack Salt's going to probably get 17 to 20, even though he starts. We know Isaiah Wilkins will get around 30. Uh, you know, the, the guards thus are probably going to get around, you know, it, it, optimal. You're going to get 30 to 32 out of those guys. DeAndre Hunter gives you 25 or so. He's, he's a, a bench guy who's basically a starter because of the way Tony plays him. He's still going to need probably 10 to 15 each out of Mamadi Diakite and Nigel Johnson to add up to your 200 minutes. Um, but, the, you know, it's doable. I mean, the, the the talent is there. It just, you know, Johnson needs to get his legs back under him. He didn't, you know, he missed those three games with the suspension. Uh, Diakite needs to stay out of foul trouble. Those are the two issues. And maybe maybe Marco Anthony has to k- get some more minutes. He played 18 against Louisville. Um, I thought I'd really quickly go through. I, I did do a, a, a column on the website today previewing Miami, so I'll, I'll go through that real quick. Miami um, has really been missing Bruce Brown, you know, the second leading scorer on this team. He's he's out until probably the first week of the NCAA tournament uh, with, with – he had surgery. I think it was a knee issue. Um, so he's out, they, but he, he, and he's listed as their second leading scorer, and you think, hey, that's the big issue they miss as the second leading scorer. He's actually also, and I think more importantly, he's their best defensive player. And that really stands out when you look at Miami's season-long stats versus their ACC stats. Their season-long stats, they're 17th in the country in defensive efficiency. But in ACC games only, when you, when you take the, all their games out and just use the ACC games, they're just 8th in the ACC in defensive efficiency. And it's because Brown, who's their, he, he's their one guy in the top 20 ACC in terms of defensive rating. He's not there, and he hasn't been there for a while. This, so this Miami team is very average defensively right now. Um, also an, an issue for, for the Hurricanes, their 6'11 center, Dewan Hewell, he's their leading scorer. So their, their second leading scorer is out. Their leading scorer, Dewan Hewell, averages 12.3 points a game. But in the last five games, he's only averaging 6.8 points. He's shooting just 46% from the field. He shoots 59% on the season. And I think there's also some pressure there with Brown not being there. Defenses have been able to key on Hewell more. And so there's there's been some problem there. Now, the one guy you'll see shoot the ball early and often tomorrow night, Lonnie Walker, the fourth freshman guard, 11.3 points a game, and he's been averaging almost 17 points in ACC play. Uh, but he'll shoot it a lot. He's a volume shooter, 41% from the field. Uh, very flamboyant-looking young man. Got the, the tall hair. He's 6'5", with an afro, 6'9", as the reference from the movie Fletch from back in the 80s. Uh, but he's also he's, you know, he's, he's a great ball handler, uh, you know, flashy. He'll get in the lane a lot. And uh, so, you know, I look at this matchup. I think it's going to be two tired teams. Uh, Miami comes in with Brown out. You know, they've, they've had to shorten their rotation a bit. Uh, and they've got a, you know a couple key guys that have had to take on more of a load with Brown out, and I think that that's kind of, I think they're in a very similar situation as Virginia, a, a tired team uh, for them, a very key game. Uh, they they it, it would be nice for Miami to get a win over the number one team in the country for their NCAA tournament resume, and so uh, I, I I fully expect Scott uh, a sort of game like we saw Saturday night, probably two tired teams out there playing defense. Uh, struggling a little bit on offense, and uh, it probably comes down to the last couple minutes, just like we've seen uh, a couple times in the last few, few, few a couple weeks from Virginia. Yeah, I agree with everything uh, you said. It's you know both these teams are kind of similarly structured right now as the way Miami suffering some some injury situation. They're both tired. Uh, it could be a similar game to what we saw last week against Florida State, or or you know. As we said, Johnson comes by, gives them some quality minutes. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, these are young kids. All of a sudden, uh, they're not as tired during the game, and Virginia wins by 10 or 12 points. I like your scenario better, so I'm going to go with yours, uh, Scott, and um, <laughs> we'll, we'll go from there. Now, I'll say for our fans listening out there, I think we're going to be wrapping up here uh, soon, but I think what we'll say is, yeah, there's the game previews on the website. Uh, so you can check that out, get more of the keys to the game, etc. Uh, and, of course, Scott and I, tomorrow night after the game, will recap things for you. Uh, I'll have a, a live blog, so join in on the live blog. We'll have updated stats and my observations during the game, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, you look forward to that tomorrow night. And then, hey, there's if there's nothing else about this, Virginia is playing basketball tomorrow night as the number one team in the country, and and nobody's been able to watch such a game for more than 35 years. And so sit back and enjoy it. 
uh, the best you can, and it should be a quite it should be a quite fun night. Absolutely, we're number one in the nation. If we win tomorrow, then we know we're sort of being able to see UVA play in JPJ as the number one team in the nation because we don't play again until next week. That's a good point. Yeah, Scott, and I talked about that earlier today, and I forgot to. I'm glad you mentioned that, Scott. Yeah, that's right. A win tomorrow night. Virginia's off next week, uh, this coming weekend. So yeah, the, the next the next game would be next Wednesday night against Georgia Tech in JPJ. And so yeah, I mean you know it's it's this is again it's more of the of, of a for the fans thing. But yeah, win tomorrow night, and, and uh, I, I guess the secondary ticket market will like that because that'll mean that there will be a lot of people who want to say that they saw with their own two eyes Virginia play as a number one team uh, in Charlottesville. Then now now that I think about that, Scott, okay. You know that that's that's looking a couple moves down the chessboard, but uh, I'm seeming to think that the last time I saw a number one Virginia team play in Charlottesville, a number one team in, in one of those two major sports, football or basketball, play in Charlottesville, Georgia Tech came to town, and it was a football game, and that that game wasn't that, the end of that game wasn't any fun. So I don't know if I like Georgia Tech coming to town next week, Scott. Uh, I think it's a little difference in quality of foot. Georgia Tech going to win the, the national championship that year, I believe, in football. And this year's Georgia Tech basketball team is going to be struggling to, uh, you know, they're going to be playing on Tuesday in the ACC basketball tournament. So a little different comparison. Here's a little fact for 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 our listeners, Chris. Virginia is one of three teams one of three schools in the country to achieve the number one ranking in football, basketball, and baseball. Can you name the other two? Oh, this is, yeah, so total guess here. Um, so, not, not to win a national championship. Just being ranked number one, yeah. To the rank of number one Associated Press in, in all three sports. Hmm, I will. Basketball, baseball, there's three schools. I will guess. Texas and UCLA, and that's just a total guess. Well, you're halfway. Texas and Florida. Florida, okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's a pretty nice, that's a pretty, that's a pretty unique and nice distinction to, to, to have, to be one of three schools in, in, in the entire country to be ranked uh, number one in the nation in all three sports. And, you know, that's, you know, that's pretty tough if you think about it because a lot of schools are, are good and for, you know you, you've got if you think about it that trifecta of being that good in all three sports is pretty difficult that's a pretty difficult because there's a lot of schools that just pretty much focus on one sport they put all their resources into being whether that's football basketball or whatever but to, to reach that plateau in all three sports uh, that to me is just uh, is a is a huge accomplishment. It is, and then there was one other, and it's not quite. It's it's it's, it's impressive in its own way. Since 1990, nine schools have been ranked number one in both football and basketball. Virginia is one of those nine. So, uh, yeah, it it shows because you're right, Scott. I mean, we talk about this a lot. Uh, you know, Duke, for example, and from an athletics perspective, is a basketball school. Virginia Tech, from a from a sports perspective, is a football school. Florida State football school. Uh, Miami, I would argue, is definitely football school. Um, you know, for a lot of schools, they're football schools, but there are there are some that are just basketball schools. That's where they put their resources, they put their extra money in their coaches, they put their extra money in recruiting and their the arena and everything else. Um, and so, yeah, to 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 have that consistency across those three, and uh, you know, and of course, you know, the the twenty five overall national championships, a lot of championships in soccer, lacrosse, and and tennis, and and all the you know all the the the, the Olympic sports as they're called. Um, and yeah, you know, it, it, it does say a lot that, uh, uh, you know, you can have, you can have that kind of success across a wider spectrum, um, if you put your attention right. And, and, uh, but yeah, for, for those of us who, who watch the big three, that's interesting. I didn't know there were only three and that's, that is quite select company to be in. Yeah. And those two other schools, Florida and Te uh, Texas. Those are major state universities too. Texas, fifty thousand students, one of the highest, uh, if not the highest, in I think uh, uh, endowment program and endowment in the country. Florida's a huge state university, so 
yeah, that's some pretty elite company that we're traveling in. It is, it is. Well, tomorrow night again, Virginia plays as number one at Miami, and uh, we all get to enjoy that. Enjoy it with us here at Augusta Free Press, live blog, post-game uh, podcast and recap, etc. So for Scott German, I will sign off Chris Graham, and once again, wahoo wah, Virginia, number one in the country. Have a great day, everybody.